What's up? What's up, everybody? So I've been telling all of my followers, all of my clients about you. I'm like, guess who I'm interviewing today? We've got oh, the angel singing, Dr. LaPera. She's the AKA holistic psychologist. Okay. I think every, I think every one of my clients follow you and uh, I love your, your memes. And uh, Dr. LaPera, I found her, you know, I don't know if I found you through another light worker, um, but your memes popped up and I was like, oh my God, this is money. This is gold. This is gold. Um, and then everything she posts, she's got this cool journaling thing. It's uh, the future, future me. You can tell us, you can correct me if I'm wrong. She's uh, got that going on um, before we end the podcast. Cause I know you're going to say, what does she have for me to buy? I'm going to let her tell us where we can find her and, and just all that stuff. But today, what my goal is, is to, uh, gosh, just in an hour, if we can do that, go over things that can help my clients. I have hot moms, hot moms, pod, hot moms podcast. And what it is, is um, when you're a mom, you go through that, well, hormone changes, but there also comes depression. It brings stuff up. Your kids, your kids bring out some stuff and uh, you either lose yourself or you make it out. And my goal is to help women come out of that. And there's just so much. Then I'm a trainer. There's eating disorders involved. So we just need your help and um, spread an awareness. And, and you're a holistic psychologist, meaning I'm guessing you take in um, food. It's, it's everything. It's, it's what you consume, media, think, thoughts. That's Dr. LaPera. And we're going to call her Nicole because she said I could, but she's got more degrees than a thermometer. But here she is. Thank you so much for carving out the time for me. Of course, Casey, is my, my true pleasure and my true honor. And any, any resources, any help, any tidbits of information that I can provide your audience I am here to do so. So thank you in all seriousness. It's people like you wanting to have conversations with people like me that I think is expanding the collective consciousness in a, in a really inspiring way, at least in my opinion. So I love it. Okay. Are you still in Philadelphia? I am still in Philadelphia for the next couple months. <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. So I was watching, uh, how do you say, I messed it up. Lewis Howes. Is that your yes. name? Okay. Yes. And he, he lives where in LA? In LA, he lives in I, West Hollywood, I guess is what it would be. I don't know the LA area, but I believe his neighborhood is West Hollywood. So are you really, you really gonna move there? I'm, I'm not moving to West Hollywood. I'm moving to Venice Beach. I'm moving from urban life, step down where I can see city life that is LA proper and see also a bit of nature that my soul is desperately God. probably so in I, January, which is me exiting out of the winter that is descending upon us. So I actually put my headband on today, but I was wearing a winter cap earlier because it's starting to get cold here. And I'm God. cold. <laughs> Hell yeah. It's suppressing as shit. And you can say cuss words on here. So we're good. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. Have you figured out yet about the, what is it about Cali? You know, it's the land of the gold and all this stuff, but there's an energetic pool. Is it ley lines or some shit? It's the energy out there. I mean, you, you brought up the, the weather here, but part of I'm realizing now because I am aware of the body. So holistically to means to me, at least means my body soul, but the vitamin D, the outside, the nature, the sun, um, that's what it is, at least for me. And like I said, having somewhat, we have a shore, a beach here within, I think an hour I can get to get to a beach here in the Northeast, but I can only get there from May until probably, if I'm lucky, end of September. And then I could go to the beach, but it wouldn't really be any, any point. No, me. you're so Venice. You're so Venice energy anyway. I love it. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, you have kitty cats and she said, hold on, let me tell them not to, to yell out. And that's hilarious. So how many do you have? Uh, truth be told, I have four of them. Boys, so, girls. I Three are boys and they are the bestest of friends. And one is a little old lady girl who lives separate from the boys because they don't, they don't not get along. She would just prefer not to be in the rough and tumble. But the, the cat I was referencing when I was joking. So I work from home in my home office, my studio, it's all one room in the back of the, the, the space. But one of my cats, I did not know this. I just thought he was a really cute white cat. I don't see many white cats. So sure, I want to adopt that one. Turns out, he is a particular breed of cat that is actually bred in or was bred initially in Philadelphia. I never knew any of this until after the fact, but long story short, we'll just say he has attachment issues. So he will likely be, he's very attached to me in particular. So 
Sometimes on one sessions, if he's crying at the door, he's banging himself against the door. So he's more of the issue than the other boys. They don't they could care less if I come or if I go. But it turns out that's with the breed of cat. He's a very people needy breed of cat. I just thought he was a cool looking cat, but yeah. Hey, Kim, what, what's his name? Cat, so what's your name? His name is George after George Clooney because he, he <gasps> So handsome and has the bluest of eyes. So. You gonna have to bring you gonna have to bring him in. Just I mean I'm okay. Well, check him out. He's sometimes on my story every now and again. He'll make an appearance. He's very large too. I put him on my story once. Funny quick story. And I had a, a, a follower send me a message asking me what the hell kind of cat is that? Because he's so big too. He's a very big. Oh, cat. You want to love big cats though. I, oh, I love big cats. I want animals again. We live in a rental house and we can't have animals, and that's what we're ready to. We're, we're thinking well, about going to a, cat, a cow behind you, a very beautiful picture of a cow <laughs> at a cow. I grew, I grew up on a cattle farm, so this is my way of being around it, you know. <laughs> uh, all right, so we got that. Never been married, married. What? Married. I have a partner. She lives in the other room and is very integral in helping me keep my life sane these days. Got it, got it. Kids? No kids, no, not going. So for all the mom, not when I speak on parenting, which I do, because I think that there's just a lot and I'm sure you and I will dive into this in terms of just healing as a human that comes up when we have children. But though I don't have personal experience with children with no plans to have any in the future. You've got uh, how many followers? So we're basically like your kids. You're uh, basically I, our mom. I, I heard, I heard, I heard as much, which brings up all different types of feelings in me, but yes. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can nurture us, you can show us. But no, reparenting, I uh, stole that from you and it makes so much sense. And okay, so I think I'm gonna go first into this. I just, I've got one hour to go on uh, the body keep score. And uh, I'll be, are you, are you empath? Are you? Right, yeah. So, yeah. So I think what most you, of us humans are on a spectrum. Obviously that's a deeper conversation, but I, we're all feeling creatures. We're energetic beings. I think some of us are much more sensitive than others, but I think the human species is very energetically uh, connected. So how, like when I was listening to that, and this goes for EMTs, this goes for certain nurses, to hear some of those stories, uh, how do, what do you do, what type of therapy do you do, or is it, I don't know how your brain works when you hear these things, how does it not stay with you? It's hard. I mean, I've heard, I've heard a lot of things, and I think a gift, I've been trying to, in my, in my future self-journaling recently, I've been trying to honor, you know, and, and notice myself and my gifts, I think, so while I hear so I, have two, I think I have two levels of reaction I have. I can hear really, really difficult things that have happened to people or people maybe have done in the world. And I've always had a gift from since I was a very young age because I was so interested in people of understanding. So I think I do have, I have the reaction, but I also have the empathetic mm -hmm. reaction. Um, if I were to speak on a personal level, I think that growing up in the family uh, environment that I was in helped me to navigate really big, really hard feelings in a way that I believe not always in a healthy way. So part of it is if you ever read my work, um, I have come to realize in my later years and in my healing journey that what I was actually doing, Casey, for a very long time was dissociating. So what that means is, right, so I'm here, I'm present. You would, I call it my spaceship where I went away and you would never know that I wasn't fully, but I say that because that's the not great side of it. I've been able to break the pattern of associating, but I think that's helped me in my work so I can contain whatever I might be feeling down here because I was so good at doing that. And I had to do that in my childhood so that I could show up very empathically for the human sharing the very difficult thing across from me. So I think it's like the double-edged sword that my history of dissociation or compartmentalization yes. will actually set me up to show up in the room in a very helpful way for many people. But of course, as I've now been able to heal and to come back into my body, I definitely am feeling much more in the moment, in real time. That's so freaking cool. Yeah. So compartmentalizing, okay. And then what do you do for cleansing? Do you do just Epsom salt? I know you can do meditations, but do you have any tips, hacks for those that are light workers and sensitive? You know, that people vomit on us, man. You know, our clients and it, energy vampires. So what do you do? What's a hack that we can kind of make sure we're cleansed? Yeah. So I, I always, and I think I frustrate people, Casey, when I answer, my hacks are never 
the quick and easies. Um, they're never the magic elixirs. Uh, so I'm not going to answer in that way. I'm going to answer in the way that I answer all things, which is making sure that as a human, you're remaining as balanced. So if that is for you, meditation, breath work, Epsom salt, whatever it is for you, it's really being the word that we love to hate, or at least my followers love to hate, consistent. It's really about being consistently balanced so that when I walk into those difficult situations, I'm carrying with me a little bit of resilience. And then it's also knowing when we have to put the pause on ourselves, our life, maybe even our work at times to more fully recalibrate and reboot. So I never, I never give people, I think what they want, which is the quick and easy, I'll do this one thing. And then it's really just the self care all the time that helps us to recalibrate. Yeah. Well, that's what like stay at home moms. They, um, there is a certain stereotype and I'm not scared to say it. Uh, real stressed out, not happy for the most part. I know this is, can be everybody, but there's my husband's a former uh, pro athlete, played for the Pirates and the Braves. Well, now he does uh, counseling through softball and baseball. So he's worked with like 75,000 families. So at this point, we can kind of stereotype some people. You know, you get a professional woman, she can leave the house. She's not with her kids all day. There's just a, ch she can check out, you know. And then you see the woman that's with her kids all day and it's just, there's a different, there's a different type. But anyway, my point is, it's that empty cup. It's the non self care yeah. because they sacrifice themselves for their kid. Yeah. It's like, no, the kid needs a happy mom. Trust yeah. me. No, and I could agree. And I want to expand that further, Casey, and just kind of offer I think what a lot of us are up against is micro and maybe, ma maybe micro, definitely macro messaging around the concept. And I'm, I'm always talking about it for this reason around the concept that self care is selfish, especially when, granted, not having children, but especially when it's little humans, you know, our offspring that we're caring for. I think a lot of us internalize a problematic message around that, that me being the priority, <clears throat> even when I have very dependent little ones, that that's selfish or wrong, but I couldn't agree more. Me being a priority allows me to be more present and a healthy, more balanced human when I do show up for whether it's my dependents or my partner or my job or my clients or whoever the hell it is. Bam. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, what do you say for this? All right. Eating disorders. First of all, what do you specialize in? Do you have a, something that you specialize in? So, I mean, now I work really holistically, which in my opinion, Casey, really does translate across quote unquote issues, symptoms, if you will, yeah. because holistically I'm of the belief that there is something underlying the symptoms. So whether it's eating disorder, anxiety, depression, I mean, really the list could go on. I expand that in all the growth directions that what I'm interested in is resolving what's driving it. So it looks different for each of us. So for some person, it may look like eating and for some person, it may look like something else. But what I'm concerned more with is instead of putting the band-aids on it where it will just pop up somewhere else, let's get the driving force of it and heal yeah. on the deepest level. Yeah, the root, baby. We're going to go to the That's root. Right. That's right. So do you do, you know, I've got this EEG brain mapping here and I noticed in the book, I don't, is he talking about EEG or Q? Well, he says some kind of brain scans. Mm -hmm. I think it's the one with the Q. I'm not, I don't know. The the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it, or the sciences of all of that, but very interesting stuff. <laughs> it is. And they, so now I'm hearing that they can do this type of stuff and you can find trauma. Do you ever, have you heard of that? Like that would cause issues in the adult life? So I am very much a believer. So again, holistic, my body connected. There are right. physiological changes, even that can be mapped on the physiological organ. That's our brain that are the result of maybe acute. And so part of, I think my messaging that resonates with a lot of people, I'm not just talking about, again, societally, what we think of when we think of the big trauma, the big acute bad thing that happened. I right. again expand <clears throat> that definition in either direction that there could be low lying under or underlying low level, more chronic unmet needs or things that have happened to us over time. But yet yeah, to answer your question simply, yeah, our brain changes, our body changes in many ways. Some of us you can see. So uh, something I always point out, and this is very just simple illustration. I'm very hunched. I have a very yeah. round shoulder, right? So for me, I understand this to be my emotions. This is how I've carried and I'm working on you know, straightening myself up, but you know, it, so whether it's that, there's your card, right? In my brain, I love it. Or in my brain, you know, we do have imprinted the experiences that we've had, whether it was one or many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, uh, emotionally, do you, do you know, Louise Hay, Louise Hayes, all that. 
you know, it's uh, carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so I bring her up because she, my partner and I lovingly used to call her, we used to live her, listen to her affirmations before bed together. And we used to call her our mom. <laughs> so I while I would be a mom, she was my mom for a very long time helping me. I love it. I love that. I love all of her stuff. So yeah, um, that's cool. Cause I was like, I'm going to draw on the cold cards today. And that's, that's cool. Um, so you get to the root of it. So we'll just go straight in since we're training nutrition and we work with, uh, some medical doctors that do bioidentical hormones. They look way deeper than just the average family care practitioner, the eating disorder, but it's that you mentioned consistency. And I don't, I can't remember if you told me this, where I heard this, there's a, there's a book out and there's a science behind it. When you set a goal, Hey, I'm going to quit smoking. What happens in your body, the response and why you have that burst of energy and release of serotonin and oxytocin and all this stuff. And then like week, a week later, you start wanting, you know, to, to smoke or you want to do something else. But really that's when you need to push through because of the hormone changes in your body. Anyway, my point is there's something that happens hormonally when you make a decision, Hey, I'm going to sign up with Casey and do this diet, but then you kind of start losing motivation. You have a whole segment series. I saw on in your Instagram about this. Uh, so I look at it from not a hormonal perspective, but so what I'm, what I'm interested in. And so in my old life, when I was working as a talk therapist, before I just, before I transitioned holistically and took into account that oh, we are a body and there might even be a soul in there for whoever's interested in that concept. Right. So meaning we have to evolve the treatment beyond just talking one day. So I yeah. say that to say the word that I cannot count to you, Casey, how many times I heard was stuck. Okay. So yeah. mm -hmm. incredible insight, right? This is what I need to do different. I go out in my life, but I'm not doing that different thing. So when I dove into my own, I self-taught all of these holistic methods. I learned a whole hell of a lot about nutrition and the body and the nervous system, all the shit that I was never introduced to in school to conceptualize and frame the way that I work now. So in those travels and journeys, which is even more surprising what I'm going to tell you next, I learned about a part of the brain, the mind, if you will, that again, was never mentioned that is called the subconscious. Okay. So the subconscious is where we need our subconscious. So I tell everyone, everyone has one, we all have a subconscious and we need it. It's the standard example of I'm driving the car and my, you know, I'm thinking about the fight I have with my partner and thank God I'm home safe and I'm putting my key in the door. How the hell did I get home? Who drove the car? Right. I call it using the computer analogy because I just think it's the easiest one that at this point we all understand. Um, we have programs to be human because if we had to wake up every day and consciously remind ourselves how to do all the things of being human, I mean, even walking is a program in a sense, we would be debilitated. So with that said, in our subconscious are these programs. We are very, very habitual creatures, right? So the reason I will proclaim this from the rooftop rooftops, Casey, because what I'm interested in is working with people to change. I mean, people come, they're like, my life doesn't look the way I want it. Shit. It's looked this way my entire life thus far. I want my future to look different. So what do we want to do? Change. Change is universally hard. So the way I understand it in terms, not from the hormonal perspective, but this does wrap in is our subconscious is geared around one concern, keeping us safe. So what is, it's a very black and white instrument. What is safe to the subconscious is that which is familiar. So all of those programs, when I can predict exactly what I'm going to do, the first thing I wake up tomorrow, I feel safe. So when I wake up tomorrow earlier, or I decide to start a morning routine that's not familiar, whether it's day one or day five, somewhere down the line, this is the language you might hear me referring to, my subconscious is going to pick up on it's not familiar and I call it mental resistance. So one of two things happen, right? The litany of reasons that my mind tells me why not to either do it the first day or keep this new habit, even though logically I know the new habit is going to better my future or some of us will register that in our body. And I think this is what you're referring to probably hormonal. It is. Right? I start to feel agitated, uncomfortable. I just feel weird. Again, further reason to go right back into that old rut that I'm Okay. So mental resistance, that's exactly what it was. Cause it was, a, it was a while back and man, I took that. I think I got a book. I don't know if you recommended it. I can't remember. I feel like the guy's name's Todd and he works with uh, like Olympic athletes and stuff. And he's got that. I can't remember. Anyway, it was all about this and he breaks it down. Uh, so to handle the subconscious, what do you do? You do hypnotherapy. Like what would you prescribe for someone that has that subconscious or whatever, that mental resistance? 
we all have it. So what I, it's about accessing consciousness, the other part of our brain, the gift that we have as humans to override that subconscious. So it's practicing and cultivating consciousness, whether it's in uh, daily meditation practice or just daily mindfulness is a great tool just to be present in the moment. But to speak to the point you offered earlier, it's in those integral moments when my subconscious mind is screaming for me to stay in bed, showing up in my conscious self and not staying in bed and getting up and walking through the discomfort that comes with change. Again, there is no, as far as I see it, easy, you know, kind of hack. Some people do. I have done a hypnosis session. Um, But again, that's consistent repetition because at some point you're still you living your day. And if you're not careful, upwards of 95% of our day, most of us are living in that subconscious autopilot. So my way out is practicing consistent consciousness and choice to create new habits and patterns each day. But by no means is it easy. We have to show up every moment for ourselves, make new choices, even when it's uncomfortable. Yep. 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 What's it? Mel Robbins, five second rule. Hey. Yeah. And that I love, I love her concept of that too, because that's again, based in that actual window that exists between the thought and then the million thoughts to not do that. So it's that same kind of, but there's no hack. It's you saying, okay, Thank you, but I'm going to sit and meditate anyway, or thank you, I'm going to whatever anyway. So, you know, uh, have you, you've read Eckhart Tolle's, I forget which one. Okay. He, is it similar to what he said? You know, hey, there's a, there's a me, there's an I and myself, there's two of me. Mm -hmm. So they need to, so what would you recommend? Would you recommend a book like that for them to figure out what are they talking about subconscious? How do I, because they're caught up in, they're in their just meat suit. They're unaware. Yeah. Um, So how can they become aware of, oh, there's two, there's like the the devil and the angel here going, stay in the bed and this one's the one, get your ass up. Yeah, yeah. I think Ecker is great. I happen to like him. Um, Depending on the listeners though, I know sometimes he can speak in a way that feels a little bit unapproachable. So actually in my newest membership, we are reading together as a group, wherever you go, there you are. It is written by a gentleman named John Kabat-Zinn who developed the concept of mindfulness-based meditation. It's a nice beginner start. Uh, so the listeners out there who maybe picked up a book like Eckerd before and feel like it feels a little too out there, mm-hmm. he helped with it. It's very practical. Um, <sighs> John Kabat-Zinn, wherever you go, there you are. A nice beginner guide. I love it. See, that's huge. That's such a nugget right there. That's going to change. That could change somebody's, you know, path right is, there. He gives practical daily exercise. So honestly, that's what I've been, my main intention, Casey, and in all the work I'm doing, because nothing I'm saying is new. I'm not some wise sage who came here and is delivering new information from the beyond. I'm saying the same things most people are saying, but I think that what makes me kind of resonate in such a big, big way is I'm saying in a way that's understandable and practically applicable for people. So it's like, Oh, great. I have this book. Well now what the hell do I do with it? It's like, Oh, this is how I can begin to integrate these changes into my day. Love it. Hey, who makes your memes? Do you make those? Uh, I was giggling when you were talking about my memes earlier because uh, it's a, it's an, it's a website. It's called Vengage. Uh, so there are templates and things like that. And I giggle because when I first went on Instagram about a year and a half ago, I was hours laboring over one meme at a time. And now I've gotten the hang of you know, how, how to use the templates and how to present information in a meme form. Uh, but yeah, that's why you make those. <laughs> you, but you do it? I do. Holy. Oh my God. All right. So you're a hustler. So you, that ain't straight up for you to be where you're at in, in, in the, uh, not even industry and in the mediums. Are you only on Instagram or you do a lot on Facebook too? So Facebook, I just recently went on. Um, I was avoiding it for, I don't know what, exactly why, uh, but I've gone on Facebook in the past month or two. I have a YouTube channel. Videos come out every oh. Sunday. Nice, yeah. simple, short videos. Um, I'm dabbling in LinkedIn a bit. A lot of it's similar content, just different presentation points. So it's it's extra work in terms of getting it up there and shifting the format of it, but it's Mm -hmm. conceptually, it it is definitely manageable. Yeah. Yeah. We got to get you out there, but I feel you. It's like, uh, I know the difference too. Facebook It's all different energies. Instagram is more fun for me. Yeah. It's definitely different. When I, I was on Instagram and then I evolved to YouTube and YouTube was an interesting new energy that I was not expecting with the, 
you know, I think the universality of it and the people that are on there and the anonymity and the comments, it's a very interesting world there. That's a little bit different than Instagram. I love it. And I love your inner child meditation. I've sent that to a lot of my um, life coaching clients. I think I've cried every time I've done it. It was, did that come, were you channeled? Were you channeling? Like, where, where'd that come from? So I, it, that's a concept inner child that I've been thinking about for a while. And I've been, it, it's again, that's one of those things that has maybe been talked about through the ages in different ways, but not really used practically. I cry too. Um, the first time I was really shook by, you know, the, how I cried, but it's not something new. People have been using it. I'm just starting to apply it in a way that I think is helpful. <laughs> I love it. So you've only been doing this for a year and a half, you said? I went on to Instagram last end of July. So yeah. Holy sh Okay. All right. Um, Because I can get way off track here. I guess we'll just go back to that. So going back to my gal that's struggling, it comes down to mental resistance. And the simple thing is, if you want it, sis, here's some things that you can do to become aware of the two voices that you're hearing from. We gave them the book. Beyond that, you know, it is what it is. Now, eating disorders or compensatory behaviors, it comes down to a control issue or no, is it simply stem from some, what, what, what's your opinion on it? What have you seen? Yeah, I think it's can stem, yes, control is one of them. There's a lot of different relationships with food a lot of us have um, based, again, a lot of these habits are ones that are formed much earlier in life that we carry with us. I see any type of behavior like eating disorders, but anything we're doing, like you're saying as a compensatory, we're coping with something beneath it. So again, okay. like we began exploring you know, what it is. So just for an example, an offshoot, you know, that's not necessarily maybe, it is, I guess, a version of control. I've come to realize one of my, I call them narratives. One of the things from my subconscious that is ever present is a narrative around scarcity. I'm sure listeners have heard of this scarcity mindset, right? Yeah. What I came to realize, observing my thoughts. So what we get, the gift that we are given when we begin to practice consciousness is a separation between me and those thoughts that I'm having. The thoughts mm -hmm. typically that are coming from that subconscious. The mm -hmm. thoughts that are on repeat, I define as narratives. We all have different versions of them, right? So one of my thought patterns I was seeing <clears throat> was of this scarcity. What I come to realize is, and I, I share this because a lot of people have this and I don't think that they realize the connection. I've come to realize that I have a lot of scarcity behaviors around food in mm. particular. And I would be really inset like insensely triggered by my partner even, right? So I remember you saying that on right? Lewis's. And I'm like, why the hell is this up? But it was a version of it. I mean, a not, you know, not as healthy as can be relationship with food um, that I developed over time because of that scarcity-based mindset. So it, it really can go globally. I mean, that's one version. Some of it is control. You know, I feel, I feel bad. I want to feel better. I'm maybe a young child where this habit developed and food was my only choice that I got to make because mom and dad or whoever the caregivers were were making all the choices around me. Some of it's connected to a negative narrative about the self. If I feel unworthy or less than or not capable of being loved, you know, maybe food is the way that I'm protecting myself, maybe from physical. I mean, so it depends on the avenue, but the clarity starts with observing the self to understand what's triggered, yeah. what's kind of driving the behavior then of whatever it's restrictive or overeating or whatever it might be. Yeah. Anorexia, it was so sad. I mean, it's like a meth addiction. It's really hard. It's a, it's, who do you, I, I feel for people that have that and people, other people judge it and be like, Oh, I wish that's, you know, they joke about it, not joke about it, but it's a real bad disease. I've seen that and it's a hard one to kick. And then I never even thought about weight issues being from anxiety, not feeling safe or like in the book, he was saying, um, if you, she got sexually abused and if she was you know fat, she put on weight, then she would not be attract, uh, attractive. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, wow, people have no idea picky eater. Now I know there's two ways. Cause you know, with gut mm -hmm. issues and stuff like that, and there may be some neurological stuff that's off who knows. Um, but the, the other thing is if you get a kid or an adult, that's like odd, just oddly over, just picky on it, just weird stuff. Really, really picky. That's a type of eating disorder, right? I don't know. You know, if you call it that, what I would be interested in is what is it about the foods that are, well, I'm going to really simplify this. Okay. To eat. What is it about the foods that aren't okay to eat? Because likely there's narratives, something, go, there's some meaning being assigned. Oh, this yeah. food is, you know, health or whatever. There's something, something. Off, there's something in the narrative framework 
of okay. this is what this food means and this is so this food means i'm a pure person and this food means i'm in, i'm pure i don't want to be on i'm just throwing a silly yeah food. yeah yeah I don't be unpure or impure so i'm not going to eat those foods or this food will mean this about me if i if i engage in those so again that's how i would think of it in terms of it was th this was a kid this was one uh, kid and there was a lot of issues there and uh, it was wild how picky he was. He was overweight. And I see this a lot with some overweight kids. They're very picky. And I'm like, okay, there's something going on there. There's something else. Would yeah, you I would say that's something? Kid, I would ask the kid, what, Johnny, what, why is it that these foods are, are okay? And why is it that these foods aren't okay? I would be interested in what the kid said because the kid has some, some vetting that it's doing. Mm -hmm. If it's aside from gut, because I do believe now, or I do know that there are a lot of how food makes me feel, whether or not my gut feels good or bad, or whether or not I'm going to be door. I mean, there, there's, it's not a coincidence that the food that we tend to overeat are the sugary or the carb based foods, because they actually do open those serotonin channels in the brain and give us that physiological feel good. So there might be a little bit of that going on with the kid. There might be a little bit of, you know, this is how I can affect change in my parent behaviors. You know, it could be a systems thing. Oh, when I eat this, mom says or does this, and that makes me feel good. Um, so a lot of exploration I would want to do to understand, but the way I've done it and the way I did it historically when I used to work with clients is ask, and you can even ask the children, try to get an idea of what they'll, or hear what they'll tell you to help mm -hmm. you understand what's driving those behaviors. But like I said, some of them might be, might be in the relationships that are happening. Totally. What's going on when mom is offering food, this type versus this type. So we're complicated yeah. creatures, Casey. Hell yeah. So would you say, uh, what kind of doc? when you were practicing before holistic and you said you were working with people like that, who can these parents seek out? Cause some of them just don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go. Yeah. So I was, this, I mean, I was a standard supportive talk therapist. I would work with families, work with kids. There are a lot of therapists that specialize in families and relationships in that way uh, with children. It's probably really helpful to get the whole family or at least a caregiver on board. But I also say this knowing I've worked with parents who are like, Oh, fix my kid. Right. And I don't, nothing exists in a vacuum, you know, if I just want to speak very bluntly. So it's more yeah. mom or caregiver and child, or maybe whole family goes in. Yeah. This part's not unique to the child. Hell no, it never There's is. Systematic things going on that the whole <laughs> system could benefit from some form of treatment. But, you know, therapy is a, is a great route to begin to explore what's going on in a helpful way and possibly get some tools to shift out of those problematic patterns. Yeah, people think uh, they'll be like, oh, shrinks and therapy, that's for crazy people. And I'm like, okay, that's why that meme's so funny. It's like, I'm getting therapy from people that need to be in therapy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, but yeah, uh, the kids always think of Caesar Milan. It's like, he, what does he say? I rehab dogs and I train the people. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Okay, uh, so when your food thing, give us an example because the story was funny. I started laughing. You said like, that's my fucking brownie or what <laughs> some, cookie. I forget what it was. And then did you figure out, did you find the root or the what tr triggered that? Like how you grew up? How was it that you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, so uh, yes, yeah, so I So two, two things. Okay. I know that well, maybe it's three things even now that I'm saying this aloud. So thought, obsessive thinking in general is a distraction. So I would obsessively think about the next meal. I would think about anything obsessively. When I was a child, I grew up in a very anxiety-ridden home experience. So I had a lot of anxiety. I had an emotionally absent mother or caregiver who was unable to help me navigate my anxiety. So I was left alone. So thinking, as crazy as this might sound, is separation. When I'm in my thinking mind, I'm out of my uncomfortable feelings in my body. So that's one, uh, one aspect of it. Um, for me, another aspect of it was connection. The one topic that my mom and I did speak of was food. So together, mom and I would exchange about what's for dinner and what do you like to eat? And what, right. So that was one of my burdens of love. So I have a really complicated relationship with food, right? So I came to realize me and mom connected. The one way we connected was love. So I would, I would try to talk with partners or friends about the next meal. Really, I had to understand what do you really want, Nicole, now? You want connection. Let's expand the conversation beyond food. Um, and then the deepest part of it was not feeling. So I've come to realize one of my core wounds is not feeling considered because my family always had some fire to put out or so they thought they were always in that overactive fight or flight state where 
I was given, while I was acknowledged typically for my performance, I was very good at school, I was very good at sport. So it's not that this is why it's really complicated. If I look back objectively, I'm like, well, one of the jokes in my family is, oh, Christ child, Nicole gets all the attention. So yes, on some level, I did. My parents were always at my games, all my academic achievements were celebrated. But on a deep level, I didn't feel seen or considered in particular as a unique little being who maybe wanted to be something other than an achiever. Obviously, I shifted into the achiever role to make sure that I got that need met. But so what it became for me is when my partner didn't save me half, what my mind told me was happening was I was not being considered. So of course, she's one of the people I love more than anything in this world. So when I'm not being considered by my partner, ow. That hurts. Yes. So now I'm going to react from that hurt place instead of saying, Nicole, it's, she considers me in a million ways. Leaving me a half of a brownie is not, doesn't have to anymore be an act of inconsideration. So it's going on, but those are what I came to realize really affected my relationship with food and eating behaviors. Yeah, that's crazy. So being considered, and that's the thing is, so for your inner child, um, what would console you, you know, back then, what would have made that okay for you to feel considered? What were you looking for? So now, I mean, as a child, I was looking for my caregiver to do that. And this is the car concept of reparenting. Now as an adult, I have to look to myself, mm -hmm. even a partner again, whom I live with and love, I have to meet that need first and foremost, because then one of two things happen. I no longer need her to consider me all the time, especially in occasions where she can't. I can't, for what I want her to put herself aside to consider me as a priority because where that ends is resentment and the relationship toxifies. So yeah. not helpful. Also, it could allow me to accept ways, be more flexible as a language I, need, I use in ways that she does consider me that maybe aren't ideal to me, but are still a great way to be considered as a partner. But I see the concept of reparenting being for each of us, identifying those wounds, identifying those unmet needs, and then now as an adult, meeting those for ourselves. So then I had to explore, because Casey, I had no fucking idea how to consider myself. I had to explore, okay, Nicole, what makes you feel considered? What like, makes you feel that you're seen, you're heard, you're first, you know, when you need to be. And then I had to build those practices consistently into my life. And then what happened is those moments really did become more infrequent and far between because I felt overall considered. She offered me the considerations that were available to her and those trigger points began to diminish a bit. Uh, 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 awesome. So what, what's, uh, you said reparenting, is there, what's your three or top one to three to five specifics like uh, to feel, to, to really, I don't know, not heal because you're not broken. I don't know. What would you do for that? I know you just told me, but is there anything more? Well, I can talk kind of conceptually. You want to look at how you care for the physical meat suit. I love that language that you're in. Okay. The reality of this case, a lot of us were not taught or modeled healthy habits in those ways. So a version of repairing, I know for me, my parents did not care for their physical health outside of, we like the immediate in my family. We like to pop the pills to feel better really quickly. We weren't disciplined in terms of habit, lifestyle, healthy creation. We wanted the quickest way to feel better. So my version of repairing as an adult was to develop those more sustainable habits that gave me the deeper health. Um, for other, you know, it depends on, on what it is. Some of us are meeting emotional needs. We're kind of down a level in terms of depth. So what are the emotional needs that again of no, and because I know a lot of mother, all the mothers listening, this is not of any ill intent, whether it's me as the child of a human, right? The human above me, my caregiver was only able to provide to me what they usually were modeled and provide to themselves. Because we cannot give something we don't know how to give. That's also going to translate to us parenting, which is why when we talked about the med, no magic elixir is about healing yourself as a human, allows you to show up in a new, more full, expanded way for your child. Yes. That's, I, I'm trying to redo, you know, I try to rebrand myself basically every day because it's so hard you know, holistic puts it in there, but holistic to me, people are like, oh, that's the crunchy granola. No, actually it's like all three things. It's, 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 a, it's all of this makes up this thing, you know? So it's hard to come up with the right term of what we can do. But I try to say, I'm, I, I'm going to help you. We can get to enlightenment in this right here. Um, 
is a portal. Fitness can be the portal for me, nutrition and fitness. For, for me, um, eating, like taking care of myself, that was my way in, I guess. That's yeah. cool. So your diet, okay, what kind of diet do you follow? So me, I eat whole foods. So I actually changed my diet pretty, pretty intensively. I started to have some really health problems when I was going through my whole dark night of the soul. I was vegetarian. So I shifted into, I guess what one would describe as a more kind of paleo, keto-based diet. Yep. Um, but <clears throat> mainly I eat intuitively. Is That's what I suggest everyone eat. I've gotten so connected with my body, which is incredible breaking my habit of association. And I've allowed my body to direct what allows it to feel good, what allows it to have the most energy and what does not the foods I avoid are foods that we know pretty universally are gut damaging that I've gotten confirmation. Um, yeah. you actually, I have a little pimple here. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but because mm -hmm. I ate gluten last mm -hmm. night, I decided very consciously that I really desperately wanted pizza. It's been a long week and I want to be some pizza. So I ate it. So I have evidence that the glutens, the processed world, the, sh the processed sugar in particular and oils, don't make me feel good. And I actually mm -hmm. get emotional symptoms sometimes. If I eat them too much, I'll get irritable or yeah. I get, I can, my skin wears it. So I use that to guide me. Doesn't mean I don't eat it. Like I said, I dove hard and heavy into that pizza last night because I wanted it yeah. knowing what it was going to cause. And you know, my body can take that level of stress. If I eat that pizza every day, I would mm -hmm. start to have a mood symptom. My hormones would go out of whack and I'd have a really big problem for me and my life. Hell yeah. I tell everybody, I'm like, eat like you give a shit about yourself. But these people are so unaware. How many years, Nicole, of therapy uh, do you mean, have you done? I mean, really? How many years I mean, I on started, yourself? I started my, I probably when I was starting my program, when I had my, my 20s, might as well have basically been one panic attack after another. Having anxiety right. my whole life, it really spiked. Right. When I moved to New York, I want to say I was 22. I'm 37. So I've been really trying to heal myself pretty intensively for 15 years. Yeah, because oh, people are going to go, oh, yes, I'm going to eat intuitively. You know, that looks good. Well, it's intuitive. No, she's done this many years. She's like a professional, okay? You can't just, that's a big difference. Intuitive means you know, you're not, you know the two voices. Yeah. Because like, what, I heard this the other day, um, you know, listen to your gut and your solar plexus and all this. Well, what if, you know, what if your solar plexus is all fucked up? And you're, you're from, you're coming from a place of fear and you don't, you don't know how to listen to it. You got it. Yeah. You know, people like you. A balanced body. That's why. So yeah. for me, honestly, I shared the piece about my health issues, uh, Casey, because when I realized that they were impacting my mental wellness, I also realized that as far as I see it, and this is why I took the hard pivot in the way that I work. As far as I see it, Casey, there is no mental wellness. If there's hormonal and nervous system imbalances in the body and the reality of it is an incredibly large percentage of us humans all over this planet at this point now are experiencing those imbalances. So that's why I knew it was an integral <clears throat> part until I got that balance. I wasn't able to differentiate what is my gut telling me or what is my mind and my stories and my fear and all of those narratives telling me. So healing does take a very long time. So a suggestion I just always offer people, if you have this to-do list of change, I, the concept I'm always going on and on about is a small daily promise because where you and I first began our conversation, change is hard and we really need to maintain these changes. We cannot do them once every now and again as needed and expect us to get the positive effects of it. We have to do them daily. So with that said, do not give yourself or I do not suggest you give yourself, anyone listening, a five item to do list. I suggest you make one small daily promise in one area, get some traction and then add one other small daily promise because we really are looking for that lifestyle based long term change and then have patience because it's you're, the positive, it will be there, yeah. but it's not going to be there overnight. And we are all, as I put it, creatures of immediacy. Of course, we want to feel better now. Of course, mm -hmm. we're uncomfortable, maybe in one way, maybe in a million ways, but we, there is just no quick fix that I have found as of yet. Mm -hmm. No, it, I desperately not. looked. Believe you me, because like oh. I said earlier, I come from the family of gulp it down and wait 20 and you're better. And I wanted <laughs> that to be the case. So I don't say this without having walked the journey of intense discomfort to speak it. I get it. <laughs> Are you gonna, have you done TED Talks yet? No, I have not. <laughs> oh, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Um, 
Do you follow Tara, Tara Brock? She's on. She has a podcast. Yeah. Girl, how funny was it when she was like, uh, "God, you know, I love her little joke. She'll put a joke in every day or whatever." It's not like the kid went to the to the yogi and how much, how long for spiritual enlightenment? He goes, "Well, ten years." He goes, "Okay, well, if I work really hard, <laughs> can, can I do five? He goes, "If you up oh, for that, it's going to be twenty. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, I've had a rain. I've actually had a push pause. I've clients showing up. What do I do next? I'm like, oh. The same thing I just told you to do for another two weeks, and then we'll talk about you know what to do next. And again, this is just my reality as I see it, and and I think that a lot of us struggle with that. That's why I'm always talking about patience and pacing, mm-hmm. and you know, meeting yourself where you're at. You will get there. Yes, I love it. And the cards for today, I drew three cards. Mm-hmm. Love yourself is what we're talking about. And that was the next one, and that was to way for me okay. is 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 loving myself is um part of it's vain. I like having a nice ass. You know, I like that kind of stuff. I do. Um, and the second part is feeling good. You know, being a, well, how we are, overachievers, go-getter, uh, partner, wife, all this shit. Man, we can't lose a day. That's why I like, I like having a drink t- or, or two. Do you drink alcohol? Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, that's very, fine. Very consciously, you know, I, I, not like I drank in my 20s. That was one of my detached mechanisms, but yeah. I know how it makes me feel. You know, there are mm. some things that don't make me feel good in terms of the types. There's yeah. definitely an amount now that does not make me feel good. So I'm very much a conscious consumer of it. Um, but yeah, I, every now and again, I do. Uh, but, but, but that's the thing is, uh, we can't lose a day. I don't want to lose a day. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ah. And then the last one uh, is, is apologizing for what have you done? Um, I have my own little mechanisms of for self forgiveness because it's nobody else's fault for me. I tell everybody, you got to take responsibility for your own shit. It ain't nobody else's fault. And the victim mentality, dear God, have you read the D- dodging energy vampire book by, uh, it's one of, it's a Hay house lady. Okay, She's like an MD. Mm-hmm. Oh, she gets into chapter five and six, a psychiatrist. She brings in her psychologist, um, get them all confused every time. Mind blown on chapter five and six on these person, these cluster B personalities. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Because have you ever been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease or no, you just said you got sick. Before. Never. No, I never went anywhere in any kind of diagnosis, uh, avenue. So I don't have any, I'm sure I probably would have come up for a Hashimoto's type of thing. Um, yeah. Adrenal fatigue. Cause I was in fight or flight my entire life um but nothing that is kind of imprinted on a a result sheet (laughs) yeah yeah uh she talks about that about how pretty much somebody like that their whole life has been not i hate to say sucked on but around narcissistic around cluster b personality people and we just uh we take it on i don't know which book i was reading once again they got the whole family sitting in a circle it was a dysfunctional family they did they did the blood cortisol levels of everybody and then after the fight was over, everybody else, they did it again. Everybody was, was better. Like it went high, it got better. But the, the kid that was sensitive like us, the empath, was fucked up yeah. because we soak it all up. Yeah. So that's, that book. Another book I just want to offer too. I don't know if you've read this one or if your listeners are interested. I, uh, Gabor Mate. I don't know if I'm saying his name exactly right. Can't spell that one. Uh, G-A-B-O-R, last name M-A-T-E. He okay. is um, when the body says no. And he talks about, because I know this will resonate probably with a lot of listeners, the people pleaser personality uh, and how the body's physical symptoms, often very autoimmune based, very debilitating even, are again, the top of the iceberg that underlies and the people pleasing personality. And how many people in there? Oh, Jesus. But right. Great book. Um, he offers case studies and things like that. Really, really helpful the way he conceptualizes it. But um, the, and he really talks about the physical toll that those types of personalities take on. The yeah. And women and women in general are taught to take care, take, take care of everybody, be this, be that, 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 that feminine, whatever. So we kind of get that double whammy. Yeah. Oh, just, oh my God. Uh, Meridian point. Do you know about those? Uh, yeah. Oh, the, the just energy systems. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. EFT. I mean, I'm somewhat, I don't, I couldn't tell where they are. I have to obviously look it up on happy google yeah 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 i know what they are and how they're helpful okay maybe you'll know this one uh i don't know who what maybe tara i can't yeah i think tara's book she says you know you go back and you you acknowledge the suffering or whatever and you tap here and even in that in that book you told me to read the body keeps score i think he says something about here what is this under your collarbone do you do any of that stuff like it's okay you're safe 
Well, what, what meridian points are just generally are, so we have energy, we're energy, we're an energy body and yeah. stuck. So emotions, and you'll hear me talk about this, this definition of emotions, emotions are energy, stuck en energy, energy is running through the body. A lot of us have stuck energies that we could have accumulated. If you believe in ancestral from mm -hmm. ancestral trauma, mm -hmm. we could have accumulated just across our own life, our, our own lifetime. So meridians and the tap that's what acupuncture and acupressure is based on so hitting particular points what you're hitting are the con conjunctions and oh, no. the places where they meet to help free up the energy so likely when you're thinking of in terms of something stressing or positive and you're hitting those points you're actually manipulating the flow of energy our goal let's put it this way as a human is to have free and it's funny we ask this every morning in my future self journal i write about because i know i still have stuck energy from mm. lifetimes probably Same. at this point um yep. and I, I know kind of where i wear it so every morning i write an affirmation that my energy runs naturally through my body and i release all stored emotions so the goal is to have energy that runs naturally through our body that doesn't mean that we are not affected by energy around us by our relationship energy by our city environment where you and what I told you is loud here right so yeah. we are but we're we need we have a system put this way that's built to recalibrate so we can have a spike in energy and then our body desires even our energy system to return to homeostasis or to balance mm -hmm. the issue is is not all of us have that balance built in we have those stuck points so when we spike we stay spiked or when we dip we stay dipped so mm -hmm. the goal is to be able to and I say this too, because a lot of people, especially when I talk about becoming conscious and viewing ourselves and our world objectively, I hear, well, I don't want to be an automaton, a robot. I'm like, oh, don't worry, girl. You're not. You're not going to be that. You, you are right now because you're, you're not aware. Gonna, you're going to be a human being that rides emotional, energetic flows. You're a conductor. But we need to return to a baseline. So to free up our meridian points allows our body to do what it wants to do, which is to return to that baseline. Got it. And that's what I was getting into um, forgiveness because I don't know about you, but if I don't know, bad relationship or what the hell ever, these cluster B people, you know, getting fucked over by people. Um, I guess that may be victim, but e either way, instead of getting mad at them or how can you not see this, you idiot. Well, calling yourself an idiot, you dumbass. That's like literally beating ourselves. It doesn't do any good. So a way to forgive yourself. Um, how would you say what's a way to just forgive yourself is it go back to that time and just tap or what how would you do self-forgiveness yeah. yeah well i think what it's funny i'm going to use your your like in your butt if you don't mind because <laughs> just to wrap this in because we have there's so much of us as a person if i really yeah. want to simplify it right there's good and bad light and dark whatever we have a poet right there's a shadow maybe you've heard shadow so oh yes girl yeah so, the goal as a human, right, is to, as far as I see it, integrate and allow it all to be okay. So when you joke, is that I, I like my butt to look good, you know, like, great. Acceptance is, I believe, a, a, a pathway toward forgiveness. Because a lot of times what we're not forgiving is a part of ourself that we're not comfortable with. So as we expand and say, okay, that's part of me. And that's okay too. That's part of my human experience too. Then we can forgive that part. What does prevents us from forgiving that part is designating it as bad, you know, and trying to squash it when it is our reality. So part of the journey is seeing our shadow and acknowledging that we're human. I know I have a shadow. I'm going to tell you, with this launch, I've been really shadow self in it recently with my sniffing it, you know, so that's part of me. I get irritable and I sniff course of those I love the most when I'm agitated that's my shadow so I have two options I can criticize myself or try to squash it or I can say you know what I'm less than shiny in that area and I can acknowledge it forgive myself and then offer my you know apology or, or whatever it, my restitution if you will the people around me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like it I like it okay um wrapping up here is there anything first of all what do you got going on now? I know you said you got a membership. So yeah, so the membership that I opened on the first last Friday is closed for this enrollment period. Um, the founding members really dove in there quickly. So what I, it will open again in the future. Anyone who's interested. So my main hub, let me back this up. My main hub is my Instagram, the dot holistic dot psychologist. I am on there daily. <clears throat> I'm putting out daily content that will never change. 
I have an email list listed in my link tree where I reference now a couple times the future self journal prompts that I put together. It goes out with a you sign up for my email list, it goes out. I wrote a comprehensive blog, you click on it, learn how to use it, all that good stuff. On that email list, I will always be releasing resources, sometimes they're meditations, things that I'm creating for the Instagram community. You can also jump on there and watch me heal right alongside of you because every morning you're watching me journal and I'm taking you really on my journey of continued healing, which I will be on for my lifetime here. That is my main hub. Like I said, I have it. Uh, a YouTube, if you, those YouTubers out there want to subscribe, also the holistic psychologist, every Sunday I do put out a new YouTube video that I hope is helpful content and healing. The membership also lives on my link tree. Gotta love link tree. I will be opening it up for enrollment at a future time. I'm going to have different kind of membership groups going probably in a couple months after I move to sunny California in a couple months. So that is something you can jump on. I have a wait list there in particular. But what the membership is, it's really harnessing the power of community and the power of healing within a supportive environment. So yeah. monthly, we dive into a topic of healing where myself and I very graciously had many other experts in different areas agree to come on and do live virtual trainings around particular content mm -hmm. areas. I'm always doing a monthly question and answer to clarify any you know concerns or issues that come up and creating helpful resources to guide. And then there's the community aspect. So for those out there, I know I, the main motivator for me to develop the membership is knowing how important and we're social creatures, knowing how important relationships are. And for me feeling very lonely and isolated when I began my journey. So if anyone's interested in what I'm kind of offering or will be offering, it will open again, probably in around March um, when I'm a little bit settled after my move, mm -hmm. but I have a wait list. And if you follow me on Instagram, I will shout from the rafters when that comes. It is closed now. And you and she charges fifty thousand dollars for a one on one healing session. Uh, no, Twenty five grand for that. I don't, <laughs> actually, I don't do I don't do one on one. So I have a, another big project in the works that I'm not yet able to speak on, but I will be hopefully in the next couple of weeks um, able to announce it. So I shifted out of one on one work entirely. I'm not able to. <laughs> Can't. To maintain that with the membership and this other new project that I cannot wait to tell everyone about. So, oh, oh, and are you gonna? You think you're gonna get a uh, journal like a, that we can buy, a future self journal? I mean, so right now, so everyone listening, right now, what it is is prompts. So you can either print them. I've had people print them, put them in a binder, or just look at the prompts and write it in a journal. I don't have that um, in the works as of yet, but you know, definitely something that I've had suggested to me. Um, you let me know. The project. When you find out, because uh, I have a little journal that I'm going to do. Uh, Shalene Johnson has a push push journal. I liked it, and then I, I bought it, and I just wanted some things that are, you know, I'd like different. You know how it is. If you journal a lot and you do what we do, we have very specific things that we know is going to get our clients results. So, uh, final draft's done, but I'm trying to figure out how the hell we self-publish this shit. So, if you find out, if anybody's listening, y'all help us, okay? <laughs> okay? Uh Anyway, there, we could go into like five different podcasts on spirituality, enlightenment, and all kind of shit. But I really appreciate your time. Um, if on your YouTube channel, it's going to help you if they go like, subscribe, and comment. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. And then if you subscribe, like I said, every Sunday, like clockwork, new video comes out. Um, if you are on both platforms, oftentimes I will be asking on the Instagram, what content you want on the YouTube. So I really do. I'm very engaged with my community over there and I help, uh, I look to them to help shape where they're at in their healing journey to create the content around that. I don't have things locked in. So I'm very much kind of following the flow of the collective and trying to meet them where they're at. So it could be helpful to be a bit on both and you can have a bit of a say. Um, but yeah, the YouTube exists and is standalone too, if you're just a YouTuber okay. listening. And then your goal in 10 years, where you want to be? You want, you want your own books? So my goal honestly is twofold is to continue to put this work out there for the collective. I'm not proprietary over any of the work I do. I'm always telling people to share my resources and use them. And I have therapists reaching out to me using them. So that wraps into my, another big goal that I'm hoping to achieve in, in 10 years is to, to fix the issue of this work not being treated in universities. Not that I'm going to affect change on the university level, but my hope is to continue to offer trainings and virtual kind of schooling options where these holistic methods are being available to practitioners of any kind, not just mental wellness, but just opening up the ability because 
honestly, if I just really quickly, I was so scared, mainly of my peers. What are they going to think of me when I'm talking about self-healing and holistic wellness in the body? And God forbid I mentioned soul. And it has been overwhelmingly supported because they, like me, are feeling really limited in their toolkit. So my big long-term goal is to integrate some more structured training from the, from the practitioner level so that everyone can upgrade their toolkit and really just help people ultimately. Oh, wherever yeah. People are. yeah, your own certification. That'd be cool. The courses. Uh, that's okay. Okay. Um, and then I'm, a, I'm about to start. I'm going to go to the Amen Clinics on the 21st to get an EMDR study done. And my goal is to connect or have somebody like maybe your membership, something. I don't know. I'm going to keep following you to see what what service my peeps can go to because yes we can help them get healthy man like we work with the doctors and all that and i do some of this stuff but i can only do so much but people like you professional that's that's doctor yeah. repairs yeah well honestly casey this has been the gift of social media for me is connecting yeah. with other people like yourself because you know it's not only just made myself maybe help me learn in a lot of ways help me feel supported being able to say oh this is a person that is really good in this area so i i see the I see the social media world. I can see it in all the ways that it's seen, of course, but I, I see it as such a gift um, of connection. Yeah. I would have never known about you and your work and been able to have this conversation with you without it. So I think no. on our practitioner level, it's, it's invaluable if you're using it in a positive way. Yeah, cool. Well, I appreciate you and uh, have fun. George did, he did so good. You need to give him- Come here, I'm interested to see where he's at and what he's doing. He's probably sleeping out there. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. I'm gonna end this recording. Thank you.